Good morning, church family. So good to see you this morning. My name is Josh. We're going to sing a couple songs. Would you please stand to your feet as we sing the lion and the lamb. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice. church family. Uh, I have with me today, this is Eli Tubbs and his sister Ellie. Uh, we are excited uh, to, to practice the ordinance of baptism this morning. Uh, the Tubbs, uh, their parents are Tracy and Marty Tubbs. Uh, they are, uh, they've been members of First Baptist Church, have been coming here for five years. And so we are excited to take this next step with uh, Eli and Ellie. 
And so uh, Eli right here, he's in sixth grade, Ellis, and he plays football. So uh, Eli, what is, who is Jesus to you today? My Lord and Savior. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's something that we can rejoice in. Uh, so uh, Eli, I'm going to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mary with Christ in baptism, raised to walk into this life. Awesome. Church family, this is Ellie Tubbs. Um, she is in eighth grade at uh, Ellis Middle School. She's a cheerleader, uh, and so she uh, came to know Christ uh, about two years ago, and so we are excited to celebrate this with her today. Uh, Ellie, who is Jesus to you? He's my Lord and Savior. Awesome. That's awesome. So if you'll turn this way, uh, Ellie, I'm going to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Yeah. Amen. I love seeing the baptism water stirred each and every Sunday morning as uh, young people, adults alike, come uh, publicly proclaiming their faith in Jesus Christ. God is good, is he not? He is a God who saves, and uh, we worship him uh, in response to that. We're glad to worship together this morning. If you're a guest here with us this morning at First Baptist, uh, we are so glad that you're here. We want to welcome you uh, and say thank you for being and choosing to be a part of this uh, service this morning. Now, hopefully, uh, you received one of these. This is our bulletin. Uh, it's got some information about the church, but inside there, there's also a connection tab uh, that says Welcome Guest. We would love for you to fill that out uh, at the end of the service. Myself, our pastor, will be out in the foyer. We'd love to meet you face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, really, our church is about connecting every generation to God, to others, and to service, and so we want to be able to connect with you uh, on your faith journey and walk with you along the way. Uh, our church, one of the things that I love about our church is our intentionality with families, with um, the next generation. We have something called our parent pathway, and part of that process is family dedication. Um, and so we've got a couple of families coming this morning. Pastor, why don't you come and lead us through this process? Yeah, we, uh, we really enjoy celebrating with families as they have new additions. And so we asked all of our families that uh, have had babies recently, that would like to do this to pick a Sunday in the month of October and uh, we would celebrate with them so uh, all, all month really almost every service is going to have a family that stands before you uh, you know as well as I do we can't make decisions for these children we're not trying to make decisions for them we're praying that we would do our part as their church family we're praying for their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles everyone who speaks into their lives that they will speak truth and that they will lead them in the things of the Lord so that one day these children, maybe at a Bible school, maybe at children's camp, maybe just in a connect group some Sunday morning, that they'll trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior and come to know Him and follow Him. That's our prayer, and we want to do our part in that. Now, what we're about to do is very biblical. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, people brought children to the temple and dedicated them to the Lord. They asked the Lord to bless them, so that's what we're about to do. And uh, D Daniel and Jill, come stand up here with me, please. And let me, will, will Molly Kate come to me, you think? Yeah? Yeah? A little bit? Maybe. No? No? <laughs> you know, if they're real young, they, they do it. But uh, when they're old enough to talk for themselves, you hear what she said? No. I'm a pawpaw. Does that not matter at all? No? Okay. Molly Kate was born on August the 31st. 2019, so she's a little bit older than two, and then Kinsley Reese is six, right? Yep, and she's got family here. I see grandparents and a great-grandparents and aunts and uncles, and they all, they're just scattered all over the place up here, and we are delighted to have you all here, first of all, that the Lord led you back to our church, and you've, you're such an important part already of the ministry, and I look forward to watching these girls grow up in the days ahead. Now, Lawson, you've confused me, sitting there holding. Uh, we're, 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 we're really messed up here, so uh, I'm going to ask Troy and Lauren to come join me, and Lawson, you're going to have to give Tad away there for a minute. This is Tad Watson. Tad was born on March the 6th of 2020, so he's a year and a half old. This is a good thing that came out of COVID. And uh, also family here all over the place. I see family members scattered, scattered out uh, across the, the room here and some right here. And uh, will you let me hold you? Huh? Yeah? 
I, he's still kind of hanging on to you. Yeah, yeah. If you'll go to Lawson, you'll come to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was it. Well, that gets you right there. All right, well, I'm going to get over here between y'all so I can get with both of these kids. Huh? What? You need the ball? That's the pacifier? I bet I'd become her friend if I went and found that. She doesn't need it? There you go. There you go. All right, now we're happy. All right. Hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for these families. They're an important part of our church. And we want to be an important part of their lives and of the, the lives of these children. We can't decide for them, but our prayer is that we would walk with them in such a way that one day in the not-too-distant future, maybe they just have a conversation at home with mom and dad, maybe in the car riding home from something, maybe here at the church. And they would say, what does it mean to ask Jesus into my heart? And they would come to that point. And I pray that one day they will be baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ I pray for these moms and dads that you would help them to be the best example that they can be. I pray for grandparents and aunts and uncles and for every person in the family that is going to invest in these children's lives. We're a part of their family of faith, and I pray that you would help us to be everything that we can be for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. We celebrate with you. Thank you all. I love it. I love it. We'll be doing that all month long. Family dedications will be happening all month long in all of our services. So cool. So, so cool. And to have Daddy singing up here with us. Come on. Somebody's going to shed a tear. Joe Walker's son-in-law. Joe, Joe Walker's son-in-law. There you go. Special shout out. Special I, shout out. I had to say it. <laughs> hey, would you please stand? Let's continue to sing together. Sing this out. Father of mercy, King of all kings, even in darkness I will sing, I will sing. Cause I've been set free, running out of the grave. Set free, bring my sin washed away. Set free, breaking out of the chains. And I'm alive. Oh, my soul. Lift up the name of the one who saves, he reigns forever. Oh, my soul, lift up your praise, I will rise and bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, oh, my soul. High as the heavens as the sea how great your love that rescued me rescued me now i've been set free running out of the grave set free all my sin washed away set free breaking out of the chains and i'm alive oh my soul lift up the of the one who saves, he reigns forever. Oh, my soul, lift up your praise. I will rise and bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. I will sing your goodness and I will sing your grace and I will love you all my days all my days I will sing and I will sing your goodness and I will sing your grace I will love you all my days all my days oh my soul lift up the of the one who saves, he reigns forever. Oh, my soul, lift up your praise, I will rise and bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, lift up the name of the one who saves, and he reigns forever. I will rise and bless the Lord. I will rise and bless the Lord. Oh my 
Let's continue to sing. Whatever impossible situation you're facing in your life, that's what we're going to sing right now. God, we believe for you. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the time will never change They haven't seen what you can do there No matter what we go through, we believe. You may be seated. Amen. This uh, passage I want to read from 2 Peter chapter 1 speaks of God's uh, provision. Um, God provides, provides for us um, our provisions, the things that we need in this world. But here he speaks and says that he gives us something even greater. It says in verse 3, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature escaping the corruption that is in this world because of evil desire. God has given us everything that we need to live a life of godliness, to pursue him, to know him, to be in relationship with him. 
He is a good God. He loves you. Would you pray with me? Father, we say thank you for your word, and we thank you for the clarity of it. And God, we thank you that you are a God who provides not just for, for our physical needs, but God, you, you provide for the very greatest need that we have, which is for life, for eternal life. And it's not just one that we get the, the life to come, but you've given us the promises, you've given us all that we need to live a life by your spirit, by your power here on this earth. God, so that we can live a life that is honoring and pleasing to you for your name and for your glory. God, I pray as we continue just to worship and to declare how good you are in your provision. God, may we be reminded this morning that we have all that we need in you. In Jesus' name, amen. and holding you up so there's nothing I can do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you pour out I'll never be more loved than I am right now going through a storm but I won't go down I hear your voice an ocean so I wouldn't drown you've never been closer than you are right now come on sing it if you know it you are Chira you are love Chira you are love and I will be content Every circumstance, Chira, you have enough. You're never enough, always enough. You're more than enough. Never enough, always enough. You're more than enough. I don't want to forget how I feel right now. On the mountaintop, I can see so clear what it's all about. Stay by my side when the sun goes down. Don't want to forget how I feel right now. You are Tyra. You are enough. I'm already chosen. I know who 
you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. Everything we need, you've already given. You will provide. And Lord, I'm sure there are people in this room who are in need right now of something. Right now, I, I pray by faith that you would provide for them in just the right moment, at just the right time, exactly what you want for them. Thank you, God, for this moment to sing that you are enough. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Great worship today. Thank you all to the worship leaders. We appreciate it very much. Wow, it's been a great day. We had the Oklahoma Baptist singing women this morning. There were probably 200 in the choir loft this morning for the first two worship services. They did a great job, and, and now uh, great worship here. We had a great service down in Wilson Hall earlier, and thank you for being a part of it. It's going to continue. We've had Bible study. We've had fellowship. We're now worshiping together. This afternoon, about 4 o'clock, we gather over at Smiley Hollow. I hope you made reservations for that. We're going to have a wonderful time. Barbecue, hamburgers, hot dogs, axe throwing. I'm going to stay away from that. Somebody might use me as a target. Uh, there's a car show. There are blow-up inflatable games for the kids. There's just a lot of stuff going on. Music all through the, the I don't know if you call it a park, but the, the, the area. There's music all around that you'll enjoy. And So I'm looking forward to grabbing some lunch and putting on some jeans and boots and heading out to Smiley Hollow. And I hope you'll plan to be there as well. We're in the third chapter of Philippians this morning, and you'll notice when I start reading it in just a minute that it starts with an interesting word. It starts with the word finally. Now, what's interesting about that is that he says as much after he uses the word finally as he did before he used the word finally. It's kind of like a preacher saying in conclusion and talking for 20 more minutes. You know, it didn't really mean anything. That reminds me of the man that had been invited to church by his neighbor. He'd never been to a church service before, so everything was new to him. He didn't know anything. And, and uh, you know, we have kind of a church language, and, and if you don't know what that language is, you can be confused. And so he didn't know what was going on, and somebody stood up and said, hey, turn and give the people around you a, a, a word of Christian grace reading so he looked at his neighbor and said what does that mean and he said well just say hello to somebody he said oh okay a little while later somebody stood up and said we're going to have a responsive reading he looked at his friend and said what does that mean and he said well the leader will read something and then we'll respond by reading something else it'll be on the screen and just kind of follow me he said oh okay a little while later somebody stood up and said we're going to receive our tithes he looked at his friend and said what does that mean he said well we're going to take an offering collection oh okay a little while later, the pastor got up to start preaching, and he took off his wristwatch, and he laid it up on top of the pulpit, and the man leaned over to his friend and said, what does that mean? And he said, nothing. It means absolutely nothing. So, so in conclusion, doesn't always mean I'm through, and that's the case here. As a matter of fact, the word finally doesn't really mean finally. Literally, what it means is uh, now for the next thought. He's changing thoughts. 
He's shifting lanes. He's still going in the same direction, but he's basically saying, I have something else I want to talk to you about now. Let's read this, beginning in verse 1. We'll go to the ninth verse this morning. If you have your Bible, follow with me. It says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me, and it's a protection for you. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I once had confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Now, you know, one of the ways that you and I learn things is through repetition. Parents know that. We say things over and over to our children. As a matter of fact, they get to a point where we finally say to them, how many times do I have to tell you? Because we've said it over and over, and they were supposed to have learned it by now, and they haven't learned it yet. When we were kids, we would do things by repetition. We would, you know, if you're learning the multiplication tables, if you're going through a list of vocabulary words, we'd put them on flashcards, and we would, we would just go through them over and over, and it was the repetition that helped us to learn it. Well, Paul knows that repetition is an important way to learn, and so he's going to repeat several things in this passage. He starts in verse 1. Look at what verse 1 says. And here's what's interesting about this. The phrase, rejoice in the Lord always is such a common phrase in our faith. It's such a common thing that we say. We, we say it. We sing it, it. It's a part of songs that we use. Did you know that this is the only place in the whole Bible that phrase is found? And yet it's such a common way that we say things. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now he says it three times right here. He says it in chapter 3 verse 1. He says it in chapter 4, verse 4. He's going to say it again in chapter 4, verse 10. And that's the only place you find that phrase in Scripture. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, the whole book of Philippians has been about finding the joy of the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord, really having joy in life. Don't you want that? We all want that. We want to be joyful people. We want to get the most out of life and to have joy in life. And so now he says that you need to be careful because there's some things that will rob you of that joy. And he's going to say one thing in verse 2. Look at verse 2. And here he says that one of the things that can rob you of your joy in life are things around you. So beware of the external things, the things that are without you, that are outside of you. And he uses, again, repetition. He says, watch out, watch out, watch out. Look at the three things he says watch out for because these will steal your joy. He says, watch out for dogs. Now, that's not a sign that you see in a neighborhood while you're driving down the street like, you know, watch out for children crossing or watch out for the pets in the neighborhood. He's not talking about your sweet little pet. He's not talking about that little poodle that you call Fluffy. He's not talking about your beautiful uh, 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 black lab, you know, Fido. He's, he, he's not talking about your family pet. He's talking about those mangy mutts. He's talking about those disease-ridden, flea-infested animals that would roam through their streets, that would sneak into their yards and homes and would grab food off their tables. He's talking about those mangy mutts that would bite, carrying rabies and all kinds of, of diseases that would bite children. He's talking about those mangy mutts that live down in the trash dump of the Hinnom Valley. He's not talking about pets. He's talking about mangy flea-infested varmints, wild animals. And what's interesting is that dogs is the term that Jews often use for Gentiles. He turns the table on them. Now, who's he talking about? What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about these Jewish people who have come to the Christians and said, it's okay for you to follow Jesus. That's fine. But first, you've got to be Jewish. 
And so you need to keep all these laws and all these rules, and you need to follow all the Old Testament, and you need to do everything that Jews do. And then once you become a Jew, if you want to follow Jesus, that's okay. He said, watch out for them. They'll steal your joy. You know, when you have people around you that are trying to tell you that in order to please God, you've got to do this and do this and do this and jump through this hoop and don't do that, and they've got all this list of rules and do's and don'ts, if you're not careful, you'll let those people steal your joy. He said, watch out for them. Second thing he said there again in verse 2, he says, watch out for evil workers. Now, what he's talking about there, again, are these Jews who think that they have earned their standing with God by what they do for him. They think that God is so honored to have them on his team. God, you sure are lucky I'm, I'm on your side. God, you sure are lucky you have me. You'd be in a world of hurt if you didn't have me. God, I may be the best thing you've got going. You sure are lucky I'm on your side. They think their good deeds, they think their works have somehow earned them right standing with God. I had a buddy in high school that we never took a class together that at the beginning of the class, first day, you know how it is, teacher starts telling you about what's expected. They give you a syllabus. They tell you what you've got to read. They, they tell you when the papers are going to be due. They give you dates. Here's when your papers are going to be due. Mark it down. Don't be late. Here's when the tests are going to be. They tell you all that stuff. It never failed that he would raise his hand and the teacher would call on him and he would say, what can I do for extra credit? Now, I don't know if he did that because he knew he was going to need it because he'd be in trouble somewhere along the way or if he was just trying to say to the teacher subconsciously, I'm the best student in this class. I'm not only going to do all this stuff that you just asked me to do. I'm going to do a little bit more. If you think your joy comes in somehow doing more than anybody else, if you think you're going to find joy in life by your good works and that God sure will be lucky that you're on his team, you are going to be sadly disappointed and that attitude is going to steal your joy because you can't do enough. Never forget, anytime anybody tells you anything other than this, they have perverted the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ is this. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And when you add anything else to that, it is no longer the gospel. These evil workers, watch out for them. Look at the third thing he says. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Then he says, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Well, now what's he talking about? Well, again, he's talking about these Jews who are telling these Gentiles that in order to, 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 to really be who God wants you to be, you've got to be circumcised. Now, you've got to keep in mind, Paul was not anti-circumcision because he had been circumcised himself. He says that later in the passage. There were some people he encouraged. If you're going to be working with a Jewish audience, you probably should do this because uh, you, you will not really have a, a, a good relationship with them otherwise. Sometimes he encouraged people to do that. That, that. that is the truth. But they have forgotten their own scripture. Their own scripture says that it is not the outward circumcision, but it is the circumcision of the heart that really matters. Let me read you a couple of passages. This is right out of their own copy of scripture. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40, it says, But if they will confess their sin, their unfaithfulness that they practiced against me, how they acted with hostility toward me, and if their uncircumcised hearts will be humbled, then I will remember my covenant with, ja with Jacob." The circumcision of the heart is what matters. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 says, Therefore, circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. The book of Romans says basically the same thing. In Romans chapter 2, it says, On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart. They had forgotten that. If somebody tries to tell you that there's some outward thing that you have to do and that unless you do that, that God's not going to be pleased with you, that outward demand that someone places on you, if you're not careful, it'll steal your joy. But then look at what he does. It's almost like while he's dictating this to someone and they're writing it down, he starts thinking about his own life. And he says, you know, you can not only have your joy be stolen by people around you who try to impose something on you that's not the gospel, you can also lose your joy yourself on, on, on the inside. 
And he goes through this litany of things, starting in verse 5. He says, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. You know, we use the word Pharisee as a bad word. They thought it was a good word. I mean, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Saul, before his name was Paul, his name was Saul. Saul was the kind of guy that the, the, the rabbinical teachers would tell their young students, you need to be more like Saul. Why aren't you like Saul? Why can't you be like Saul? He goes through this long list of things, and, and this is what he's telling us. If you think that your joy in life is going to come by you doing all of these things, it, it's, it's those things that are actually going to rob you of the joy that God has for you. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, beginning in verse 7, along in there, going 7, 8, and 9, he, he almost gives a little bit of what I would call um, a spiritual audit. He uses some accounting terms. Uh, I, I read the word consider. He says it in verse 7, consider a loss. In verse 8, consider. Again in verse 8, consider. Some of your translations may say count. It's, it's, it's an accounting number. Count it a loss. Count it gain. Count, count. He's talking about accounting. This is what he says. I thought all of these things that I was doing, that they were making me closer to God. I thought that they were giving me better standing with God. And what I've come to understand is that those things, they weren't in the positive column of my life. They were in the negative column of my life. He says, I came to understand that my only joy came in knowing him. You see that? I, I don't want you to miss this. Now, we'll talk about this again next week, but I want you to see this very clearly in verse 8. Moreover than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. If you think that anything in this world is going to bring you joy other than a relationship with Jesus, you're going to be disappointed. The government's not going to bring you joy. Oh, if this person does this or this person does that, look, we're always going to be frustrated with that. Now, I will say we'd better elect some good people into office because we are headed down a road that has no return. We had better elect some good people for office in the days that are ahead. We'd better do something. But let me tell you something that's happened. Several decades ago, those who oppose a Bible worldview decided that they knew how they could change the culture of America. And they started a process that is now moving at warp speed. They started with Hollywood. It was movies. And, and, and then they went into the entertainment industry. It was music. And, and, and it was what young people were listening to. I'm telling you, you are being brainwashed. And you're being brainwashed, and you're being brainwashed, and it happens every day. You find me a television program on a network television channel that does not have an agenda of homosexuality, of marriage that is somehow supposed to be acceptable today. You find a program that does not have an agenda built into it. I'm telling you, you are being brainwashed. They figured out two decades ago how to change American culture, how to change the way people think. And it is like a, a, a frog boiling in water. That water has just slowly been turned up to a point that we don't even notice it. Let me tell you how bad it is. This week, it was announced that Superman is bisexual. That, don't laugh. That is, that's a cartoon for kids. What are they trying to do? They're trying to change the way people think. And if you think that you're going to find joy in the culture around us, you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to find joy in that. Because we're people of the book. We're, we're people of God. We have a Bible worldview. We don't see things through the lens of this world. We see through things through the lens of God's world. We will never be satisfied with what's happening in this world around us. The only way we can find joy is in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now look at what he does. Let me show you one other thing before I stop today. 
Look at the end of verse 8. He says, because of him, that's Jesus, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth. All the things that Paul thought would bring him joy in life, he now says, I consider them filth. And the things that I didn't think amounted to very much, I've come to realize those are actually the things that bring joy and purpose and meaning. Those are the things that are going to allow me to rejoice in the Lord. I want you to focus on that word filth, though. You know what that word means? It can be translated garbage. That is an accurate translation. Filth, garbage, you know, that, that's true, but it's deeper than that, and it's, a, it's an uglier word than that. Some of your translations may say, I count them now as dung, D-U-N-G. You know what the word for that is? That's manure. Now, I didn't say this in the other two services because your, your grandparents were in there and it would, it would really upset them, but it's doo-doo. <laughs> All those things that I thought, let me, let me make it a modern, I've never said that in a sermon before in 40 <laughs> years. Let me modernize that for you. All the things that I thought would bring meaning and purpose and joy in my life is the same as human waste that has such a stench to it that it is only good to be flushed. The only way you're going to find joy in your life if you're looking through a biblical worldview, if you're walking with the Lord, the only way you're ever going to find joy is in the Lord. The world will never bring that. So let me bring it back where I started a little while ago. Anything other than this is not the gospel. It's a perversion. We are saved by grace. Say it with me. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that's the only place. That's the only place that we'll find joy. Let's pray. Lord, we're living in such an upside-down world. Our, our, our world's been brainwashed. We can't listen to a TV show or music or even conversations without a worldview being brought into it that is the antithesis of your word. And we'll never find joy in that world. We'll never find joy because we are your people. Lord, teach us what Paul learned. That the only way to truly have joy is in the Lord. And that if the whole world goes the other direction, that we choose to walk with you. And in that we will have purpose and meaning and life. I pray for young people. I, I, I feel for young people who they hear it every day at school. They're being taught a, a worldview that is so different. All around them, it's, being, it's just being force-fed to them, and I feel for them. And yet somehow we've got to learn to take a stand, to love people, yes, to respect people, yes, to be Christ-like, yes, but at the same time to take a stand for truth because our joy is in the Lord and nowhere else. And so, Lord, like Paul, I say that all the things of this world that one time I thought would bring me purpose and meaning and happiness, it is nothing more than a pile of manure. And my joy is in the Lord. I pray that we would be committed to that truth and that we could encourage each other to a deeper walk with Christ. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we always do. Pastor Brandon and I will be standing here at the front. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you, encourage you, help you whatever way we can. The altar's open. Of course it's open if you want to come and kneel and pray. Let's worship him now. Let's stand together. The team will lead us in another song. Let's worship him now as we sing. We fall 
come down We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus The greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy, holy, holy we cry holy, holy, holy we cry holy, holy, holy is the close the service, I want to just remind us that God is faithful. His, his word is sure. It does not, it does not end, it does not um, ever lose its power. Amen. And that we as his people are called to be the salt and light in this world. As we live a life of joy that we find in Christ and Christ alone, we live that out in front of this world for them to see the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen. May we be the people that God has called us to be in this world. Thank you for being here. You know, our church, one of the things that we're emphasizing this semester, really this year, is our men's ministry. Um, I know a study that's been on Tuesday mornings has been incredible for so many of you men, but one of the things that I'm excited about coming up in two weeks, um, if we're going to raise up men, it starts with our boys. And coming up the 29th and 30th, we have a father-son adventure weekend. If you're a dad and you've got a second grader through a fifth grader, we're going to go away for a Friday night and to a Saturday afternoon. We're going to talk about Luke 2.52, that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. What does it mean for a little boy to grow up to be a man? And here's where it starts. It starts with you as the dad investing in the life of your son. God designed it that way. He created that way. And imagine this. Research shows that there's no greater influence in the spiritual health and life of your son than you as a father. It matters. In fact, research shows this, that a devout father will never make up for a distant father. So we want to create a weekend, we want to create an experience for you and your son to get away, to go on adventure, to have some fun. We want you to be a part of that. If you haven't signed up, make sure you do so. Uh, the information's in the bulletin. We're very excited about that. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you at Smiley Hollow. Um, enjoy that experience tonight. God bless you. If you're a guest, our pastor would love to meet you. He'll be right out here in the foyer.